Peter Vermees. Peter, it is great to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. My pleasure. It's uh, I'm, I'm happy to be with you guys. Uh, okay, so you're no stranger to uh, the drama that Decision Day often brings. This is a massive six-pointer for you guys against Minnesota. They call this the friendliest rivalry in sports, but somehow I don't <laughs> think that's going to be the case on, on Saturday with so much on the line. What's been your message to the team leading up to this one? Uh, obviously, you guys know you guys talked about it. We had obviously a tough start um, this year. Our objective was when we were, you know, our projection from a medical perspective and everything else that we're going to get to a place right around League's Cup that we might get the majority of our guys back, um, barring somebody didn't have a reoccurrence to an injury. And so it was coming out of League's Cup in that to make sure that we're in a position where we at least had a chance to make a push at the end to make the playoffs. And so the guys have put themselves in that position. And as I told them, I said, you know, it, it's now time to finish the job. Um, it's easy also to take your eye off of what you have to do and you're worried about everybody else. And so it's it's that time where you stop worrying about everybody else and you just stay completely focused on yourself. P PV, it's it's great to see you. You look the same as as you did when I was a, a young 20-year-old uh, trying, to, trying to make the U U.S. youth national team. Watching Sporting Kansas City. Just a City, little more gray. Just, just a, a little, little gray. gray. That's it. <laughs> watching, watching this Sporting Kansas City team, uh, when you have an Alan Polito who's, who's healthy and confident, what a difference maker is, that is for, for the club. Is that it? Is that all you need, basically? Because if you had him, it feels like you would, we'd be farther up the table because of, of how clinical he is and how he opens the game up in the attacking third. Look, I, I, there's no doubt that he's a big he's a big part of who we are. I, I think what happened to us early on is is so many guys were trying to do more than they needed to to make up for some of the things that we were missing within the group. And so, you know, then all of a sudden guys are overcooking it. They're 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 taking too many touches. They're 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 maybe not shooting when they should. They take an extra touch and now the guy has a chance to block it. Um, maybe they shoot and they should make an extra pass or they make an extra pass and they should shoot. We, we were just, we were outside of ourselves. And I think he no doubt has helped us uh, from a, a, a calmness, confidence, um, and then just our, our way of playing. Um, I always said when we first, when we were first, you know, uh, finalizing the deal uh, when we originally brought him in, I'd said, I, I don't know of another forward that, in my mind's eye, fit the way we wanted to play any better. And so uh, getting him has been great. Not having him in has been horrible, but having him back has, has helped out immensely. And I think it's helped all the rest of the guys around the group. Um, Peter, I want to ask you how difficult it is to prepare to play a team, even though you have a pretty good record against uh, Minnesota. But how do you prepare for a team that has a, a new coach, big coaching change? And uh, does it make it more difficult? Uh, but before that, I also want to know, if you win, will we actually get to see you smile? <laughs> I'll take that one last. Um, I think prior records mean zero in these situations, um, and, and in most cases cases because I think no matter how much time lapses by um, things always change you know uh, players could wake up on the wrong side of the bed uh, a, a coach could make a, a personnel change in the team uh, a, a guy could be confident at the time when you play the first time and the second time he's not as he's not informed so I think all those things are out the window I, I think what these games come down to is you know I during the course of the year, you get in my position, you get asked a lot of times, you get asked, hey, um, is this a must win for you? And I, I'm always very, very hesitant to say uh, yes, because a lot of times they're not. Yeah, you want to win. You go in every game, you want to win, but they're not at those moments. The only times they're must wins in a situation like this and also a final. Those are your two situations, and I consider this to be a final. And Susanna, you asked a question earlier down the stretch here, I've told the guys that every one of these games is a final, knowing full well that we were going to, you know, probably not win every one of them, but it was to have that mentality that that's what you're paying, playing in. And, and the final piece is, is that, uh, you know, I enjoy what I do, but, you know, I, I, I remember years and years ago, I listened to an interview um, 
uh, and uh, with a, with another coach, and he was asked this question: Is that what would you take? What would you tell any prospective uh, wannabe managers? What, what you know? What advice would you give them? And the first thing he said was, "If you're not willing to suffer, you should not get into this profession." <laughs> and and I, I don't think you could sum it up any better. It's you. I love the profession. I love what I do. Um, at the same time, you have very few moments that you get a chance to enjoy, even when you win, and, and when you win championships, because immediately you have to get on to the to the to the next uh, objective. You know, either it's the next game or it's the it's the next season or what have you. So, um, if anything, I'll be happy for the players because I think that if there's one thing that you know, I, I've said this all along. Again, another question been asked. Hey, do you think you know you guys should get more credit for you know different things that you've done? No, I, I don't believe that. What I do think is that the players should give themselves credit for staying um, in it. Meaning, every game we played except for one half all, through this whole through this whole year, did I ever ever question the commitment by the guys? Mm. Um, and that, that's that, that's saying a lot especially when you play as a congested season as we do in MLS. Well, PV, you just talked on what advice you'd give to a, to a potential coach. But what about a sporting director? Because you do both. And for someone to have been in your position for so long, since 2009, that speaks to the culture that you have and just how good of a man manager you are. So my question to you is, what advice would you give to a potential sporting director? And then on top of that, how, I know you're a loyal guy as well. So how do you have those conversations with, you know, players who have served the club for a long time to say, hey, time's up, you know, thank you for your service and what you've done, but I think we have to, to part ways here, and, and that's part of the business. But how do you have those conversations? Yeah, I, I'll go with the first question. Um, I, I think as a sporting director, you have to have the long-term view. And I think it's one of the things that has helped me immensely because as a coach, you're short term, right? You're like, oh my God, next game. Uh, I, I, we, you know, we got to, because whatever you did last game doesn't matter anymore. Next game's coming up. You got to win. You got to win. And if you don't win, now all of a sudden everybody's like, well, you didn't win the last game. Uh oh. You better get a good result in the next game. And so that's a short term world. Sporting director's long term. And so I've, I've come to realize over the years that one of the things you can't do is you can't overreact. You know, things are never as bad as they seem, and they're never as good as they seem. You, you, you're usually somewhere in the middle. And so when you're evaluating your, your, your team, you're evaluating what you play, you're evalu evaluating individual players, you have to have a, a level of, of patience and calmness. Um, I've always said, you know, when you take this job, one of the big things you got to have is you got to have a, 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 a big heart and a short memory. <laughs> because if you, if you didn't have those two things, nobody would ever play. Um, because guys make mistakes. Things happen. I mean, I make mistakes. I tell the players all the time. I make mistakes all the time. Maybe I don't put the right starting 11. Maybe, you know, I said, hey, we should press this game instead of drop off. And, you know, but we all got to live with each other and we got to find a way to come up with solutions. We also have to have trust. So I think as sporting director, it's, it's more patience and it's long-term view. The, the final question is a lot harder. It, it, it just is. It's, uh, I always think that, and I've always said this, when I, when I came into this job, um, I had played for a lot of teams over my 15 year career. I played for a lot of managers. And to be honest, there's a lot of times where, shoot, I never even got any conversation, let alone if I did, a lot of times they were, they were more to appease than they were direct and, and honest. And so I was new from day one. For me, it was gonna be exactly the second one. It's gonna be direct and honest. And I know that sometimes we all don't like what we wanted, you know, we asked for something, hey, can you tell me what you think? And then you get the information and you don't like it. Um, for me, it was always to be that. What I've always tried to do is I've tried to do it with respect. I've tried to do it um, as timely as I possibly uh, can. Um, and then the last piece is you, you, can't, you can't sweep something under the rug. You have to deal with it right away. And if you deal with it right away, you, you, you get two things. One is you get that problem off of your head that you're not thinking about it. But the other is, is that you allow the other person to know that, hey, this is this is a, 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 a problem or a challenge, and I'm giving you as much time as we as you, you can get to try to solve it. And I think 
those things always usually bode well for you in the long run. Doesn't mean that every situation is going to be great, but you're dealing with it right away. Peter, you spoke about your playing career. And what I like when we're talking at OGs of U.S. soccer, it's that their stories are different. Because now you see the guys going over to Europe, they're superstars. They've got, they're playing for the best teams in the world. They've got the, the cars. Ferraris. They've got, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it's different. You guys were pioneers in this move. You played in Hungary, the Netherlands, second division Spain. What was an ex that experience for an American abroad in those times? So, you know, everybody, you know, I, I don't have all the history and everything, but I do know that Paul Caligiuri and myself were the two guys that were the first Americans to be playing Division I uh, in Europe uh, at, at any time. And, and I'm saying born in the United States and then going overseas. In Hungary, the first place I went, so just kind of give you the, the environment. I lived at the stadium. What? What? The stadium, the stadium and the training facility were on the same plot of land. It was all enclosed. They had uh, seven, if you will, well, six dorm rooms and one, uh, one apartment for the caretaker of the entire facility and his family. And so when I got there, I came there right after the Olympics. And then in 88, the Olympics were, uh, were pushed back later because of the weather in, in Korea. And so I didn't start with them until late September, October. And it just didn't make sense for me to now spend all this time trying to find an apartment and all these other things. So they offered me this opportunity. They said, hey, listen, you want to just stay here for a couple weeks in, in this dorm room until we find you a place and all that stuff. How old are you? I was 20, 22, maybe 20, somewhere like wow. 21, 22, 23, somewhere in there. And I was, I was single as well. This wouldn't have flown if I was married. But, <laughs> uh, but I, I lived in a dorm room at the stadium. Now, the great thing was when I woke up in the morning, honest to God, I was, I was 25 yards from the locker room. So that was great. <laughs> Can't be late, huh? So when I hear these guys talk today and, Oh, too much travel and all this other stuff. Yeah, it doesn't even doesn't even resonate with me. Nah, different times. Seriously, built differently. Wow. Uh, well, Peter, one of the one of the things that I love and admire about you, there are many things, but I know that you very much enjoy a nice glass of red wine after a game. So on Saturday, if you guys win, if you get a little help from a few other teams and you are able to make it to the playoffs and play in that play-in game. What wine will you be drinking? So I'll share this with you. Uh, uh, we have, you know, like six owners within the within the team. Um, our our one of our major, majority share owners, uh, Cliff Illig, his wife Bonnie Illig. Bonnie and I have a a, a great relationship. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I play for a, a great ownership group. I, I really do. I'm. I'm it, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate in that regard. we got a great relationship. But anyway, uh, one day, uh, and, and, and I know, Susanna, you've been through the stadium and in the owner's box, but they never call it that. It's called the Victory Suite. They have a, a, a wine closet up there, and obviously there's some, some high-end wines. And so uh, one day, I, one, one game years ago, years ago, I asked Bonnie, I said, Bonnie, you got to send somebody upstairs to go get a, a good bottle of wine. Um, Sorry, my my light in my office went out. Um, I said I said uh, uh, you got to go up and get get somebody to get a good bottle of wine after this great win today. And, and it might have been something. Maybe it was home. We won the U.S. Open Cup or something. I don't remember. But uh, at any rate, so she did. And then afterwards, she said, "Well, for now on, when we win, I'll I'll get a good bottle of wine. I'll have one brought down." So it's been kind of this tradition ever since. Um, and it's also been funny at times because obviously when we were going through the stretch this season and not having one and we had one and obviously we didn't play every game at home because in the first 11 games we played eight of them away. Um, after like the third or fourth game, she said, you know, there's a good and bad to this. And I said, what's that? And she said, the, the, the bad is I haven't been able to go get the good wine. Um, the bad is is the time is allowing it to get better and better when we actually drink it. So I don't know if I bought into that because I would have rather have drank the wine a lot earlier. Uh -huh. But 
she picks it. Um, so it'll be good no matter what. She's got good taste. I if you it. lose, you get a box of Franzia. <laughs> <laughs> if we lose, I don't get anything. <laughs>